Hello, everybody. Today I'm here with our reading club. As you know, Tess Reading Club is uh, an amorphous group of students and literature enthusiasts and uh, scholars from different parts of the country. And we have been reading literary works, enjoying doing it and inspiring a lot of people to read in the past few months. We'll just wait for a few couple of minutes so that people will join. You might have joined us before in the previous sessions on the way of the world. The way of the world is an amazing text. It was written in 1700 at the beginning of the 18th century, just after Jeremy Collier's attack on the restoration right, comedy writers. Jeremy Collier, as you know, was a Puritan who did not like the immorality that was associated with the text, sorry, the theater. And he attacked Congreve especially. Congreve replied with the way of the world. And the way of the world, incidentally, is his chase test play. So thank you all for joining us. Hello, good afternoon, Pranshu. Today we are reading The Way of the World, Act 3. Why do we do this every week without fail? Because reading literature is an exciting habit that we have acquired. Now our test reading club members enjoy it so much. They've developed such a passion for reading that they can't do without it. Reading literature is what each and every one of us should do. If possible, read aloud, read together, and even apply reader response, criticism, ideas on it, and analyze it. Your experience of reading, probably write a paper about it, there are so many things we can do. So today, literature, education, and all of our professional activities have become very collaborative. I think in the age of internet, in the age of online education, the most important thing is this collaborative effort. We are not doing anything by ourselves individually anymore. We are doing it in conjunction with a lot of other things, including people, other people. So as a, an exciting educational experience, I'm an experiment. I am watching the progress of TESS Reading Club. We invite you to join us. You can drop a message in the chat box and otherwise uh, contact us. Tess, you can contact us. We, you will be added and you can join our group if you wish. You can start your own reading clubs. I was talking to some of the reading club members and sharing their experience of reading. I was amazed to see how much they have fallen in love with these texts and these characters. It is a very deep experience. So today, as a special case, I invite some of our Reading Club members to talk to us for just one minute and share their experience of impersonating characters, reading out like this. I'm sure it'll be uh, amazing and life-changing for you if you do that yourself. So I invite the Reading Club members 
to come and share your experience with us and then go ahead and read Act 3 of The Way of the World by William Congreve. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. This is Chitra. I'd like to tell you something. It was in first year of my graduation that I read my first novel. I clearly remember it was My Journey by APJ Abdul Kalam. Before that, I didn't know much about literature and had no first-hand experience about reading texts. Believe me, that was a turning point in my life as a student of literature. After that, my beautiful journey with literature started. Though I can't say I have read a lot, but, uh, but uh, once I read, uh, I have read, whatever I have read changed me in some way or the other. The magic that you feel in the company of a text is like no other experience, believe me. From Shakespeare to JK Rowling, from Milton to Kamala Das, each of them have uh, something to give you that none other has. And this is the reason I invite you to delve in the, into the beautiful world of literature with me. For me, it was my college professor who initiated me into this beautiful world of literature. Now we all have Kalyani Ma'am to journey with. And through Test Reading Club, the opportunity we have got is, is like no other opportunity. So I think we all should use this opportunity and understand the value of reading text, firsthand knowledge, experience of reading text. And I'm sure once you join, or once you start your journey with literature, this will also become one of the best experience of your life. This will become a turning point of your life too. So with this, I would thank ma'am for um, giving us this opportunity, giving we, all of us this opportunity uh, to participate in this reading club. Thank you so much. And hope you will all, uh, even if you don't join test reading club, you will read on your own. and will join us in this beautiful journey of literature. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yes, ma'am, may I? Please speak. Hello, everyone. Firstly, do I want to share that I am not a good speaker. I have never been a good speaker. Most of the times I am nervous not confident about my pronunciations, clarity in my voice expressions. I think that it is something that we all go through and it's a lifelong battle. But these reading sessions, the group that I have joined is really helpful. As on regular basis, we read. And we read aloud with people. We make mistakes, we learn from mistakes, and then we again try to improve ourselves. And this is something really beautiful. Because the reading sessions, the reading group, help us to improve, help allow us to make mistakes. And we don't feel ashamed that we usually we do. And this is something that is making me to overcome my fear. And this habit of reading has made me more confident. I have started enjoying and living the reading sessions. And the first book, the novel that I have read was God of Small Things. And it was really challenging because I was in standard 12. And most of the things I couldn't understand. But when I read today, I do understand things. And reading literature is more like reliving the lives of other people, the experience of other people, it makes us a better person. And reading with people who are so positive about life makes you more positive and it will help us to grow together. It is helping me. So that's all. I just want you all to read. Read as much as you all can. This reading is really good. Everyone should read. So, yes, that's all. Good afternoon, friends. My name is Bhavna, and uh, I will want to share my experience of Test Reading Club, reading with Test Reading Club with you all. 
My experience has been phenomenal. I would like to share that I'm a mother and as a mother, I have always wanted my son to be a reader. Right now he's very young, but as a mother, I have understood one thing that if you want your child to inculcate a certain good habit, you will have to practice it first. Reading is something very important. I've always understood this. I have been a reader in past years when I was a student. Well, I am a student uh, now also, but in last few years, I've somehow uh, not have developed on this habit of reading. But with Test Reading Club, I did get this platform of reading again, and I'm enjoying it. The atmosphere here is just amazing. You will get to learn a lot from your fellow readers. The best part about the Test Reading Club for me is that I'm setting an example for my son to see me reading and understand its value. And uh, hopefully he will also inculcate this habit. And for our listeners, I am hoping that some of you will definitely join us so that we can have a variety over here. We can also learn from you. So hoping to see you in, see you in future. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Pratima. So after joining this test reading club, I have improved a lot in my reading session. I am glad to express my expressions and my... Uh, one second. I, I want to share you one line, okay? Which, I made, which made me to read a better thing when shall we three meet again in thunder lightning or in rain fair is foul and foul is fat hover through the fog and filthy air this is a famous dialogue which witches three witches used to sing in macbeth this is the first dialogue in my reading session in this test reading club. So I used to make lot of mistakes while pronouncing or while speaking. Since after facing all the difficulties, this is a place where I enjoyed my reading with the silly mistakes and I have to correct it myself. Often I used to do many mistakes while I am reading, but in this platform, because of our ma'am and our friends who made me to motivate my reading, to improve my reading in a better and better every day. So who is really interested in reading or if you are really want to read but you have certain mistakes also, you can overcome by joining our test reading club. This is a good platform. Here, we can improve our reading. If you are really interested, you can join and you can take part with us. It is a very amazing thing. I have enjoyed many things in this reading club. And one more thing I have to tell for you people that even though if you are not well known towards many plays, novels or short stories, dramas, poetry, prose, everything. We can't read each and everything. If we are reading through this reading club, we can know all the major and minor characters which we are not coming through our reading, by, uh, through our uh, UG and PG, whatever it may be. We are not coming across each and every topics, each and every prose novels. So in this place, we can know many novels, many authors, intro for many minor characters also. So with this, I thank our ma'am and others to give, uh, thank you for giving this opportunity for sharing my opinion. Thank you all. Hello, myself, Anjali Vagmare came here to share my experience about this amazing reading club. 
I have joined this club with poor confidence, but I like to connect with dear Kalyani ma'am. So dear to read. The journey is amazing. While reading with my fabulous friends of literary club, I move forward step, step by step. It's very interesting, mostly when reading the poems of Sylvia Plath. I like that session so much. Every Sunday, we are enjoying the literary feast. Hope. This reading club became a milestone in literary field and will be very hopeful and useful for the students as well. Thank you so much, dear Kalani ma'am, for always being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, readers. So today, with the blessing of our respected ma'am and with the presence of the enthusiastic readers, we are going. We are here to read out Act Three of the Way of the World by William Congreve. Though not only the longest act, but also it summarizes the concept of the whole Restoration comedy in it. The witty and courtly rake, and the dull-witted man of business, the country bumpkin, who is understood to be not only unsophisticated but often either puritan or another form of dissenter. Thus, it emphasizes the importance of literature as a backbone of our society. The way of the world's creation. of the older restoration comedies pattern is the only one of the things that made the play unusual and the most enjoyable part of this act is the song of scene 12 yes because it acts as an allusion to the play's presentation of love just as the song describes the thrill of competition in the hunt for a beautiful swan the characters do enjoy the competition to win milamen's hand though more out of greed than love so without wasting a second i hand over to our narrator to proceed Scene nine, Mirabel, wait well. Sorry, Act three, scene one. A room in Lady Bishford's house. Lady Bishford at her toilet, Peg waiting. Merciful! No news of Foible yet. No, madam. I have no more patience. If I have not fretted myself till I am pale again, there is no veracity in me. Fetch me the red, the red. Do you hear, sweetheart? An errant ash color, as I am a person. Look how this vent stirs. Why dost thou not fetch me a little red? Dost thou not hear me, Mopus? Red, red, I fear. Does your lady sip me or the cherry brandy? Red, I fear, fool. No fool. No, the red, I fear, fool. Grant me patience. I mean the Spanish paper, idiot complexion, darling. Paint. Paint, paint! Dost thou understand that? Changeling, dangling thy hands like bobbins before thee. Where dost thou not stop, puppet? Thou wooden thing upon wires. Lord, madam, your ladyship is so impatient. I cannot come at the paint, madam. Mrs. Foible has locked it up and carried the key with her. A box, take you both. Fetch me the cherry brandy then. 
seen lady wishford and as pale and as faint i look like mrs combs take the curate's wife that's always breeding wench come come wench what are thou doing shipping tasting save thee dost thou not know the bottle scene 3 lady wishford peg with a bottle and a china cup madam i was looking for a cup a cup save thee and what a cup hast thou brought dost thou not dost thou take me for a fairy to drink out of an acron why dost thou not bring thy thimble hast thou near a brass thimble clinking in thy pocket with a bit of nutmeg i warrant thee come fill fill so again see who is that one knock set down the bottle first here here under the table what would a dog go with the bottle in thy hand like a tapester as i am a person this wench has lived in an inn upon the road before she came to me like meritornis the asturian in don quixote no foible yet no madam mrs marwood oh marwood let her come in come in good marwood scene 4 mrs marwood i'm surprised to find your ladyship in dishabille at this time of day foible's the lost thing has been abroad since the morning and never heard of since i saw her but now as i came marks through the park in conference with mirabel with mirabel you call my blood into my face with mentioning that traitor she does not have the confidence i sent her to negotiate an affair in which if i am detected i'm undone if that wheedling villain has brought upon foible to detect me i'm ruined oh my dear friend i am a wretch of wretches if i'm detected oh madam you cannot suspect mrs foible's integrity oh he carries poison in his tongue that would corrupt into gritty itself if she has given him an opportunity she has good as put her integrity into his hands oh dear marwood what's integrity to an opportunity hark i hear her dear friend retire into my closet that i may examine her with more freedom you'll pardon me dear friend i can make bowl with you there are books over the chimney quarrels and pyron and the short view of the stage with bunyan's work to entertain you go you thing and send her in to peg scene 5 lady wishford foible oh foible where has thou been what has thou been doing madam i have seen the party but what hast thou done nay this your ladyship has done and not to do i have only promised but a man so enamored so transported well if worshiping worshiping of pictures be a sin poor sir roland i say the miniature has been counted like but hast thou not betrayed me foible hast thou not detected me to that faithless mirabel what hast thou to do with him in the park answer me has he got nothing out of thee so the devil has been beforehand with me what shall i say alas madam could i help it if i met that confident thing was i in fault if you had heard how he used me and all upon your ladyship's account i am sure you would not suspect my fidelity nay if that had been the worst i could have borne but he had a fling at your ladyship too and then i could not hold but i faith i gave him his own mimi what did that filthy fellow say oh madam tis a tis a shame to say what he said with his taunts and his fleers tossing up his nose hmm says he what you are a hatching some plot says he you are so early abroad or catering says he fretting for some disbanded officer i warrant half pay but a thin subsistence says he well what pension does your lady propose let me see says he what she must come down pretty deep now she's superannuated says he and 
oh, it's my life. I'll have him. I'll have him murdered. I'll have him poisoned. Where does he eat? I'll marry a drawer to have him poisoned in his wine. I'll send for Robin from Lockett's immediately. Poison him? Poisoning's too good for him. Starve him, madame. Starve him. Marry Sir Roland and get him disinherited. Oh, you would bless yourself to hear what he said. A villain. Super unweighted. Hmm, says he. I hear you are laying designs against me too, says he. And Mrs. Milliman is to marry my uncle? But, says he, I'll fit you for that, I warrant you, says he. I'll hamper you for that, says he. You and your old frippery too, says he. I'll handle you. Audacious villain, handle me. When he dressed, flippery, old flippery. Was there ever such a foul mouse fellow? I'll be married tomorrow. I'll be contracted tonight. The sooner, the better, madame. Will Sir Roland be here, says thou? When foible? Incontentedly, madame. No new sheriff's wife expects the return of her husband after knighthood with that impatience in which Sir Roland burns for the dear hour of kissing your ladyship's hand after dinner. Flippery, superannuated flippery. I'll flippery the villain. I'd reduce him to flippery and rags and a tatter de malian. I hope to see him hung with tatters like a long lane penthouse or a gibber thief, a slender mouth railer. I warrant the spendthrift prodigals in debt as much as the million lottery or the whole coat upon a birthday. I'll spoil his credit with his tailor. Yes, he shall have my niece with her fortune. He shall. He, I hope to see him lodge in Ludgate first and angle into Blackfriars for brass farthings with an old mitten. Ah, dear foible, thank thee for that, dear foible. He has put me out of all patience. I shall never recompose my features to receive Sir Roland with any economy of face. This wretch has fretted me that I am absolutely decayed. Look, foible. Your ladyship has frowned a little too rashly. Indeed, madame. There are some cracks discernible in the white varnish. Let me see the glass. Cracks, says thou? Why, I am errantly flayed. I look like an old peeled wall. Thou must repair me, foible, before Sir Roland comes, or I shall never keep up to my picture. I warrant you, madame, a little art once made your picture like you, and now a little of the same art must make you like your picture. Your picture must sit for you, madame. But are thou sure Sir Roland will not fail to come? Or will a not fail when he does come? Will he be importunate, foible, and push? For if he should not be importunate, I shall never break decorums. I shall die with confusion if I am forced to advance. Oh no, I can never advance. I shall soon if he should expect advances. No, I hope Sir Roland is better bred than to put a lady to the necessity of breaking her forms. I won't be too coy neither. I won't give him a despair. But a little disdain is not amiss. A little scorn is alluring. A little scorn becomes your ladyship. Yes, but tenderness becomes me best. A sort of dyingness. You see that picture has a sort of a half foible, a swimmingness in the eyes. Yes, I look so. My knees affects it. But see Vern's features. Is Sir Roland handsome? Let my toilet be removed. I'll dress above. I'll receive Sir Roland here. Is he handsome? Oh, don't answer me. I won't know. I'll be surprised. I'll be taken by surprise. By star, madame. Sir Roland's a brisk man. Is he? Oh, then I'll importune. If he's a brisk man, I shall have decorums. If Sir Roland importunate, importunes, I have a mortal terror at the apprehension of offending against decorums. Oh, I'm glad he's a brisk man. Let my things be removed, good foible. Scene six, Mrs. Fainil, foible. Oh, foible, I have been a fright, lest I should come to light. That devil Marur saw you in the park with Mirabel, and I'm afraid will discover it to my lady. Discover what, madame? Nay, nay, put not on that strange face. 
I am privy to the whole design. I know that wet well to whom the word this morning married is to personate Mirabel's uncle and as such winning my lady to involve her in those difficulties from which Mirabel only must release her by his making his conditions to have my cousin and her fortune left to her own disposal. Oh dear madam, I beg your pardon. It was not my confidence in your ladyship that was deficient, but I thought the former good correspondence between your ladyship and Mr. Mirabel might have hindered his communicating the secret. Dear Foible, forget that. Oh dear madam, Mr. Mirabel is such a sweet winning gentleman. But your ladyship is the pattern of generosity, sweet lady, to be so good. Mr. Mirabel cannot choose but be grateful. I find your ladyship has his heart still. Now, madam, I can safely tell your ladyship our success. Mrs. Marwood had told my lady, but I warrant I managed myself. I turned it all for the better. I told my lady that Mr. Mirabel railed at her. I laid horrid things to his charge, I'll vow, and my lady so incensed that she'll be contracted to Sir Roland tonight. She says, I warrant, I worked her up that he may have her for asking for, as they say of a Welsh maidenhead. Oh, rare foible. Madam, I beg your ladyship to acquaint Mr. Mirabel of his success. I would be seen as little as possible to speak to him. Besides, I believe Madam Marwood watches me. She has a month's mind, but I know Mr. Mirabel can't abide her. John, John, remove my lady's toilet. Madam, your servant. My lady's so impatient. I'll fear she'll come for me if I'll stay. I will go with you up the back stairs, lest I should meet her. Scene seven, Mrs. Marwood alone. Indeed, Mrs. Engine, is it thus with you? Are you become a go between of this importance? Yes, I shall watch you. Why this wench is the past part out, a very master key to everybody's strong box. My friend Fainil, have you carried it so swimmingly? I thought there was something in it, but it seems it's over with you. Your loathing is not from a want of appetite then, but from a surfeit. Else, you could never be so cool to fall from a principal to be an assistant to procure for him a pattern of generosity. That I confess. Well, Mr. Fainal, you have met with your match. Oh, man, man, woman, woman, the devil's an ass. If I were a painter, I would draw him like an idiot, a driveler with a bib and bells. Man should have his head and horns and woman the rest of him. Poor, simple, fine. Madam Marwood has a man's mind, but he can't abide her. It were better for him. You had not been his confessor in that affair. Without, you could have kept his counsel closer. I shall not prove another pattern of generosity. He has not obliged me to that with those excesses of himself. And now I'll have none of him. Here comes the good lady, panting ripe, with a heart full of hope and a head full of care like any chemist upon the day of projection. Scene 8 To her, Lady Wishfort Oh dear Marwood, what shall I say for this rude forgetfulness? But my dear friend is all goodness. No apologies, dear madam. I have been very well entertained. As I am a person, I am in very chaos to think I should forget myself. But I have such an all your affairs, really, I know not what to do. Call. Foible? I expect my nephew Sir Wilful every moment too. Why, Foible? He means to travel for improvement. Methinks Sir Wilful should rather think of marrying than traveling at his ears. I hear he is turned of 40. Oh. He is in less danger of being spoiled by his travels. I'm against my nephew's marrying too young. It will be time enough when he comes back and has acquired discretion to choose for himself. Methinks Miss Malamant and he would make a very fit match. He may travel afterwards. It is a thing very usual with young gentlemen. I promise you, 
I have thought on it, and since this your judgment, I'll think on it again. I assure you I will. I value your judgment extremely. On my word, I'll propose it. Scene 9. To them, foible. Come, come, foible. I had forgot my nephew will be here before dinner. I must make haste. Mr. Whitwood and Mr. Petulenta come to dine with your ladyship. Oh dear, I can't appear till I'm dressed. Dear Marwood, shall, be free, shall I be free with you again? And I beg to entertain them. I'll make all imaginary haste. Dear friend, excuse me. Scene 10, Mrs. Marwood, Mrs. Millerman, Mincing. So, any, never anything was so unbred as that odious man, Marwood, your servant. You have a color. What's the matter? That horrid fellow, petulant, has provoked me into a flame. I have broken my fan. Mincing, lend me yours. Is not all the powder out of my hair? No. What has he done? Nay, he has done nothing. He has only talked. Nay, he has said nothing neither. But he has contradicted everything that has been said. For my part, I thought with wood and he would have quarreled. I vow, ma'am. I thought once they would have fit. Well, it's a lamentable thing, I swear, that one has not the liberty of choosing one's acquaintance as one does one's clothes. If we had that liberty, we should be as weary of one set of acquaintance, though never so good, as we are of one suit, though never so fine. A fool and a doily stuff would now and then find days of grace and be worn for variety. I could consent to wear them if they would wear alike, but fools never wear out. They are such drab the very things. Without one could give them to one's chambermaid after a day or two. It were better so indeed. Or what you think you of the playhouse? A fine, gay, glossy fool should be given there, like a new masking habit after the masquerade is over. And we have done with the disguise. For a fool's visit is always a disguise and never admitted by a woman of wit, but to blind her affair with a lover of sense. If you would but appear barefaced now and own Mirabel, you might as easily put off Petulant and Bidwood as your hood and scarf. And indeed, it is time for the town has found it. The secret is grown too big for the pretense. It is like Mrs. Primley's great belly. She may lace it down before, but it burnishes on her hips. Indeed, Melamint, you can no more conceal it than my lady's trammel can her face, that goodly face, which in defiance of her Rhenish wine tea will not be comprehended in a mask. I'll take my death, Margot. You are more censorious than a decayed beauty or a discarded toast. Mincing, tell the men they may come up. My aunt is not racing here. Their folly is less provoking than your malice. Scene 11. Mrs. Millerman, Mrs. Marwood. The town has found it. What has it found? That Mirabel loves me is no more a secret than it is a secret that you have discovered it to my aunt or than the reason why you discovered it is a secret. You are nettled. You are mistaken. Ridiculous. Indeed, my dear, you'll tear another fan if you don't mitigate those violent ears. So oh, silly. <laughs> I could laugh immoderately. Poor Mirabel. His constancy to me has quite destroyed his complacence for all the world beside. I swear I never enjoined it, it him to be so coy. If I had the vanity to think he would obey me, I would command him to so more gallantry. It's hardly well bred to be so particular on one hand and so insensible on the other. But I despair to prevail and so let him follow his own way. <laughs> Pardon me, dear creature, I must laugh, <laughs> though I grant you it's a little barbarous. <laughs> what pity! It is so much fine raillery and delivered with so significant gesture. Should be so unhappily directed to Miss Carey. Huh? Dear creature, I ask your pardon. I swear I didn't mind you. Mr. Mirabel and you both may think it a thing impossible when I shall tell him by telling you. 
oh dear what for it is the same thing if i hear it <laughs> That I detest him, hate him, madam. Oh, madam, why so do I? And yet the creature loves me. <laughs> How can one forbear laughing to think of it? I am a sable if I am not amazed to think what he can see in me. I'll take my death. I think you are handsomer and within a year or two as young. If I could, if I could but stay for me. I should overtake you, but that cannot be. Well, that 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 thought makes me melancholy. You know, I'll be sad. Your merry note may be changed sooner than you think. Do you say so? Then I am resolved. I'll have a song to keep up my spirit. Scene twelve. To them, men sing. The gentlemen stay, but to come, madam, and will wait on you. Desire, Mrs. That is in the next room to sing the song I would have learned yesterday. You shall hear it, Madam. Not that there's any grand, any great matter in it, but it's agreeable to to my humour. Song. Love is but the frailty of the mind when there is not with ambition joined a sickly flame which if not fed expires and feeling wastes in self consuming fires. This not to wound a wanton boy or amorous youth that gives the joy, but is the glory to have pierced the swing for whom in fear beauties sight and wing. Then I will own the conquest prize when I insult a rival's eyes. If there's delight to love, this when I see. That heart which others wait for, wait for me. That heart which others wait for, wait for me. That heart which others wait. Scene 13. To them, Petulant Whitwood. Is your animosity composed, gentlemen? Raillery, raillery, madam. We have no animosity. We hit off a little wit now and then, but no animosity. The falling out of wits is like the falling out of lovers. We agree in the main, like treble and bass. Ha, huh? Petulant? I, in the main, but when I have a humor to contradict. I, when he has a humor to contradict, that then I contradict too. What? I know my cue. Then we contradict one another like two battle doors for contradictions beget one another like Jews. If he says black's black, if I have a humor to say it is blue, let that pass, all's one for that. If I have a humor to prove it, it must be granted. Not positively must, but it may, it may. Yes, it positively must, upon proof positive. 
I upon proof positive it must, but upon proof presumptive it only may. That's a logical distinction now, madam. I perceive your debates are of importance and very learnedly handled. Importance is one thing and learning is another. But a debate is a debate. That I assert. Petulance, an enemy to learning. He relies altogether on his parts. No, I am no enemy to learning. It hurts, not me. That's a sign, indeed. It's no enemy to you. No, no. It's no enemy to anybody but them that have it. Well, an illiterate man's my aversion. I wonder at the impudence of any illiterate man to offer to make love. That I confess, I wonder at too. Ah, uh, to marry an ignorant that can hardly read or write. Why should a man be any further from being married, though he can't read, than he is from being hanged? The ordinary spade for setting the sum, and the parish priest for reading the ceremony, and for the rest which is to follow. In both cases, a man may do it without book. So, all's one for that. Do you hear the creature, Lord? Here's company. I'll be gone. Scene fourteen. Sir Wilful Whitwood in a riding dress. Mrs. Marwood, Pitulen, Whitwood, Footman. In the name of Bartlemew and his pack, what have we here? It is your brother, I fancy. Don't you know him? Not I. Yes, I think it is he. I have almost forget him. I have. Not seen him since the revolution, sir. My lady's dressing. Here's company. If you please to walk in. In the meantime, dressing. What? It it's but morning here. I warrant with you in London. We should count it towards afternoon in our paths down in Shropshire. Why didn't we like my aunt hadn't dined yet, our friend? Your aunt, sir. My aunt, sir. Yes, my aunt, sir. And your lady, sir. Your lady is my aunt, sir. Why? What does thou not know me, friend? Why? Then send somebody hither that does. How long has thou lived with thy lady, fellow? Huh? A week, sir. Longer than anybody in the house except my lady's men. Why then, Bila? Belike thou dost not know thy lady if thou seest her, her friend. Why, truly, sir, I cannot safely swear to her face. In a in the morning before she is dressed, it is like I may give a shrewd guess at her. By this time, well, pretty, try what thou canst do. If thou canst not guess, inquire her out, thus dear fellow, and tell her her nephew, Sir Wilful Whitwood, is in the house. I shall, sir. Hold you, hear me, friend. A word with you in your ear, pretty. Who are these gallants? Really, sir. I can't tell. Here comes. Here comes so many. Here it is hard to know them all. Scene fifteen. <coughs> Sir Wilful Whitwood, Ethelin Whitwood, Mrs. Marwood. Means <coughs> this fellow knows less than a starling. I don't think I knows his own name. Mister Whitwood. Your brother is not behind hand in forgetfulness. I fancy he has forget you too. I hope so. The devil take him. Them remembers first. I say. 
save you, gentlemen and lady. For shame, Mr. Whitwood, why won't you speak to him? And you, sir? Whitwood, speak. And you, sir? No offense, I hope. Salutes, Marwood. No, sure, sir. This is a wild dog. I see that already. No offense. Ha ha ha. To him, to him, Petulan smoked him. It seems as if you had come a journey, sir. M M, surveying him round. Very likely, sir. That it may seem so. No offense. I hope, sir. Smoke the boots, the boots, Petulan, the boots. Ha 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 ha. Maybe not, sir. Thereafter, as it is meant, sir. Sir, I presume upon the information of your boots. Why? It is like you may, sir. If you are not satisfied with the information of my boots, sir. If you will step into the stable, you may inquire further of my house, sir. Horse, sir. Your horse, sir? Your horse is an ash, sir. Do you speak by way of offense, sir? The gentleman's merry, that's all, sir. Slife, we shall have a quarrel betwixt an horse and an ass before they find one another out. You must not take anything amiss from your friends, sir. You are among your friends here, though it may be you don't know it. If I'm not mistaken, you are Sir Wilful Whitwood? Right, lady. I'm Sir Wilful Whitwood, so I write myself no offense to anybody, I hope. And nephew to the lady wish forth of this mansion. Don't you know this gentleman, sir? Hmm. What? Sure, it's no. Yeah, by your lady, but it is. Sure. I know not whether it is or no. Yeah, but it is. By the Red King. Brother Anthony. What? Tony? I wait. What, what does thou not know me? By your lady. Nor I thee. Thou art so beprivated and so beprivated. Sha, why dost not speak? Art thou overjoyed? Art so, brother? Is it you? Your servant, brother. Your servant? Why? Your sir? Your servant again? Sha, and your friend and servant to that? And a... And a flat dragon for your service, sir. And a hair's food and a hair's cut for your service, sir. And you by so cold and so courtly. No offense, I hope, brother. Shut, sir. But there is and much offense. A pox, is this your ends, O oh, cold breeding? Not to know your friends, your relations, your elders, and your betters. Why, brother, will full of sallow? You may be as short as a shaftsbury cake, if you please. But I tell you, it is not modest to know relations in town. You think you are in the country? Where great liberty brothers slubber and kiss one another when they meet, like call of surgeons, it is not the fashion here. It is not indeed, dear brother. The fashion is a fool and you are a fog, dear brother. Sha, I have suspected this by a lady. I conjectured you were a fog since you have begun to change the style of your letters and write in a scrap of paper gilt round the edges, no bigger than a sapoina. I might expect this when you left off on a brother, and hoping you are in good health, and so forth. To begin with, a rap me, nine, and so sick of a life last night's debauch. Odds, huh? 
and then tell a familiar tale of a cock and a bull and a hole and a bottle and so conclude. You could write news before you were out of time. When you have lived with honest pump and nose, the attorney of Furnival's end, you could entreat to be remembered then to your friends round the wrecking. We could have gazettes then, the docs letters and weekly bill, till of late days. Sly Whitwood, were you ever an attorney's clerk of the family of the Farnivals? Ha ha ha. Ay, ay. But that was but for a while. Not long, not long, Sha. I was not in my own part then, an orphan, and this fellow was my guardian. Ay, ay. I was glad to consent to that man to come to London. He had the disposal of me then. If I had not agreed to that, I might have been born apprentice to a felt maker in Shasbury. This fellow would have bound me to a maker of felts. Sha, I'm better than to bound to a maker of fox, where I suppose you have served your time. And now you may set for yourself. You intend to travel, sir? As I'm informed, well, I kind me, madam. I may chance to say upon the salt sea if my mind hold. And the wind, sir. Sir, or not, sir, I shan't ask license of you, sir, nor the weathercock, your companion. I direct my discourse to the lady, sir. It is like my aunt may have told you, madame. Yes, I have settled my concerns, I may say now. And I'm minded to see foreign parts, if and how that peace holds, whereby that is taxes obeyed. I thought you had designed for France at all adventures. I can't tell that. It is like I may, and it's like I may not. I am somewhat dainty in making resolutions because when I make it, I keep it. I don't stand shall I, shall I, then if I say it, I'll do it. But I have thoughts to travel a small matter in town to learn somewhat of your lingo first before I cross the seas. I gladly have a spice of your French as they say, whereby to hold this course in foreign countries. Here's an academy in town for that use. There is? It is like they have me. No doubt. You will return very much improved. Yes. Refined like a death skipper from a whale fishing. Scene 16. To them, Lady Wishfort and Fainel. Nephew? You are welcome. Um, your servant. Sir Fearful, your most faithful servant. Cousin Flanagan, give me your hand. Cousin Whitwood, your servant. Mr. Petulant, your servant. Nephew, you are welcome again. Will you drink anything after your journey, nephew, before you eat? Dinner is almost ready. I am very well. I thank you, Aunt. However... I thank you for your courteous offer. Shan, I was afraid you would have been in fashion too. And have remembered to have forgot your relations. Here's your cousin Tony. Belike I, I may not call him brother for fear of offense. Oh, he's a railer, nephew. My cousin's a wit. And your great wits always really their best friends to choose. When you have been abroad, nephew, you'll understand really better. Fainel and Mrs. Marwood talk apart. Why? Then let him hold his tongue in the meantime and rail when the day comes. Scene 17. To them, mincing. Mom? I come to acquaint your lordship that dinner is impatient. Impatient? Why? 
then be like it won't stay till I pull off my boots. Sweetheart, can you help me to a pair of slippers? My man's with his horses are roaring. Fine. Fine, if you, you would not pull off your boots, yeah? Go down into the hall. Dinner shall stay for you. My nephew is a little unbred. You'll pardon him, madam. Gentlemen, will you walk? Marwood? I'll follow you, madam, before Sir Wilful is ready. Scene 18. Mrs. Marwood Fainel. Why then, I was born. An errant rent went to be born. And I, it seems, a husband, a rent husband, and my wife a very errant rank wife, all in the way of the world. It's death to be a cuckold by anticipation. A cuckold in embryo. Sure, I was born with budding antlers like a young setter, or a citizen's death to be outwitted, to be outjitted, out matrimony. If I had kept my speed like a stag towards someone, but to crawl after with my horns like a snail, to be outstripped by my wife, this is called be wedlock. Then shake it off. You have often wished for an opportunity to part, and now you have it. But first, prevent their plot. The half of Miraman's fortune is too considerable to be parted to a foe, to Mirabel. Damn him, that had been mine. Had you not made that fond discovery, that had been forfeited, had they been married, my wife had added after to my horns by that increase of fortune. I could have worn them tipped with gold, though my forehead had been furnished like a deputy lieutenant's hall. They may prove a cap of maintenance to you still, if you can away with your wife. And she is no worse than when you had her. I dare swear she had given up her game before she was married. Hmm, that may be. You married her to keep you, and if you can contrive to have keep her, you better than you expected. Why should you not keep her longer than you intended? The means. The means. Discover to my lady, your wife's country, freedom to part with her. My lady loves her and will come to any composition to save her reputation. Take the opportunity of breaking it just after the discovery of this impulsion. My lady will be embraced beyond bounds and sacrificed peace and fortune and all at that point. And let me alone to keep her calm. If she should flag in her path, I will not fail to prompt her. Hey, this is an appearance. I'm sorry, I hinted to my lady to endeavor a match between Milaman and Sir Wilful. That may be an obstacle. Oh, for that matter, let me to manage him. I will disable him for that. He will drink like a dame. After dinner, I will set his hand in. Well, how do you stand affected towards your lady? Why, Faith, I'm thinking of it. Let me see. I'm married already, so that's over. My wife has played the jade with me. Well, that's over too. I never loved her. For if I had, why that would have been over too by this time. Jealous of her? I cannot be, for I'm certain. So there is an end of jealousy. Weary of her, I am and shall be. No, there is no end of that. No, no, that were too much to hope. Thus for concerning my repose. Now for my reputation. As to my own, I married, not for it. So that's out of the question. And as to my part in my wife's, why she had parted with us before. So bringing none to me, she can take none from me. This against all rule of play that I should lose to one who has not wherewithal to stay. Besides, you forget, marriage is honorable. Hmm, faith. And that's well thought on. Marriage is honorable, as you say. And if so, wherefore should Kukuldom be a discredit, being derived from so honorable a root? Nay, I know not. If the root be honorable, why not the branches? So, so, why this point is clear? Well, how do we proceed? I will contrive a letter which shall be delivered to my lady at the time when that rascal means to act Sir Roland is with her. It shall come as from an unknown hand, for unless I appear to 
to know of the truth, the better I can play the incendiary. Besides, I would not have Quibble provoked if I could help it. Because, you know, she is some passages. A, I expect all will come out. But let the mind be stung first, and then I care not if I am discovered. If the worst come to the worst, I'll turn my wife to grass. I have already a deed of settlement of the best part of the estate, which I wield out of her, and that you shall partake at least. I hope you are convinced that I hate Mirabha now. You'll be no more jealous. Jealous? Not by this kiss. Let husbands be jealous. But let the lover still believe, or if he doubt, let it be the only to endure his pleasures, and prepare the joy that follows when he proves his mistress true. But let husbands doubt converts to endless jealousy, or if they have belief, let it corrupt to superstition and blind credulity. I am single and will hold no more with them. True, I wear the badge, but I will disown the order, and since I take my leave of them, I care not if I leave them. A common motto to their common crest: All husbands must, for pain or shame, endure. The wise to jealous are, fools to secure. Thank you, thank you very much, all the readers and the listeners. We hope we have tried to present ourselves in our best tone, but pardon our mistakes and do enjoy reading with us. thank you very much thank you very much guys i was here all along and it was wonderful nobody is afraid of mistakes here it's okay it's human err uh, to err is human and to forgive divine and also we learn from our mistakes no problem at all you are definitely improving and i'm sure this video will inspire a lot of people to read 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 and enjoy thank you very much see you next week I'm ending the session.